cats, cops, and C4. Vera's gales of laughter as they ride through the city are heartening. She had demanded to know what the hell was so funny and she was now watching her first kid's cartoon courtesy of the human imagination. It's so stupid. She's clearly enjoying herself. So gang, Laszlo begins still pretending to be Freddy. Is anyone going to draw attention to the fact that we have a guest? If she wanted to hurt us, she would have already. Believe me. Chenk says, both acknowledging and dismissing the empty handmaster in the back seat behind him. Vera jumps in surprise as Linda draws her shock pistol to point it at the woman. When did you notice? Kylon asks. She's sitting in the absolute back of the van where she had snuck in. A while ago, Chenk says, not giving her an answer. And you did not react because, she asks. You've shown that I can't beat you in a fight something that you would have if you wanted it. So you're here for something else. What is up for debate? Have you done no research or study on my order? I'm in the middle of an extensive case dealing with a criminal mastermind that clearly thinks nothing about getting people to kill each other by the dozens. There was a non-zero chance that you were put in a position where drawing attention to you might make you go on the offense. At this range, in this situation, that's asking for casualties. How many? Kylon asks curiously. Depends how many cars our van hits on the way down, Chank remarks. Ah, I suppose that's a downside to drone piloting. I don't feel the danger as keenly. Laszlo semi-apologizes, and that's why you called her out. So what was your big plan if I proved hostile? For the record, I'm not. My employment by the one you call the Shroud is terminated, and I'm here for issues regarded the empty hand order, an entirely peaceful act where we reevaluate some initial assumptions. If anything, I'm on your side now. Should a fight break out, I'm on your team. For now, Kylon explains. Ah, so we've gone from reckless fools that are probably just a publicity stunt to an actual military? Laszlo asks as he merges into another lane. We knew you were a legitimate military action from the beginning. There were other assumptions made that you've currently proven wrong. I'm merely trying to see if what I observed was the exception and not the rule, or the other way around. Are you talking about that gunfu shit he did or about operating on that kind of level? Laszlo asks. Gunfu? Kylon asks. Martial arts techniques with a gun. Uh... One of the most popular and well-known combat styles on Earth is called Kung Fu, so Gun Fu for doing something similar with a gun. Laszlo explains, sounding a little uncertain. He's more the type to get the information than give it, and this is no superior officer he's answering to. I take it from your hesitation that it's not a common thing to do? Guns are extremely lethal. They can kill in a single shot. Almost all martial skill with a gun is about accurate use, quickly using it and maintaining the equipment. Actually, developing a combat style is pretty much redundant. Meaning that Mr. Barnabas made his up as he went, Kylan muses. Not completely. Martial arts with guns may have never been needed, but there's been a lot of speculation on what it would look like. Meaning you took something you saw off of a bit of entertainment and made it into a semi-effective fighting style? Kylon asks. Basically, the general idea of guns is that they're long-ranged weapons and using one in melee is just plain stupid. But you did so anyways. Standing around to fight you wasn't intelligent. I should have tried to lure you away and then use a teleport beacon. That wouldn't have worked. Your first assumptions were completely correct. I would have outpaced you and could and would have blocked teleportation. Standing and fighting was a stupid thing to do, but it was the less stupid thing to do. Kai Lan notes, Hmm, I don't suppose you're going to just tell us what you're looking for specifically, so we can yay or nay it before we get to our destination. We don't need distractions with how dangerous things are getting, Linda asks. If you're asking me to stay out of sight and out of the way, that's easily done, Kylon says before forcibly opening the rear door.
Hurricane force winds blast through the air van as the woman is ripped out by the winds. Alongside Vera's handheld communicator and all sorts of little bits of dirt and debris that no one noticed. The doors close automatically and before they slam shut, the communicator flies back in through the gap. It lands perfectly into Vera's lap and there's a dead silence broken only by the Scooby-Doo opening chiming out as the next episode plays. Well, that just fucking happened, Laszlo says in a stunned voice. Jesus Christ, thank God for seatbelts, Chank mutters. Are all empty handmasters crazy as all hell or do we just have bad luck? I don't think it's just them. Take a look at every really big group of powerful warriors. The battle princesses of Serbo run around in ballroom gowns. The Crimson Hewers not only have a red fixation, but will only paint their armor according to the blood splatters of enemies killed. Grandmaster Hunters seem to obsessively make booby traps and treat everything like game. Wait, what? Oh right, sorry. There's a mission report where one of our agents in intelligence has a Grand Hunt's mistress for an in-law. She treated every interaction between them like a combination of a game and a test. Hmm. Huh. I didn't know that, Chink remarks. Also, she's an ancient Zedin with a genetic abnormality that inverts the typical species to gender matchup when it comes to births and has apparently sired entire demographics. So, a family woman and hunter to the infinite degree while also looking like she got lost in horror movie set for a while. Chink summarizes and Laszlo nods. I'm going to be called out as a hypocrite if I complain about how weird things are, aren't I? At least you're aware of it, Linda says in amusement. We're nearly there. Hopefully this interview will have less drama than the ride over. Oh, please. With the way things have been adding up, you've got better odds of walking into a massive drug deal that spills over in a gang war that engulfs entire spires. Laszlo remarks blandly. Dude, the hell? We're in the line of fire, asshole. Chank snaps at him as they zoom in on the parking areas next to the old building. You're in the line of fire. I'm a hair over a thousand kilometers away and chugging my way through a six pack even now, Laszlo says, and Chank just gives the grinning man a glare. Don't you just hate me? You do realize I am perfectly able to legally and formally requisition a training spar with you, right? I have the legal right to make you fight me without the robot. Chank threatens him and the outright feral grin on Laszlo's holographic face lets him know that it was a threat of a good time. I know, he says simply as he sets down the air van. So how are we doing this, officer? Do I go in with you or... I'm taking Chank and Vera in with me. We were all seen together during the drug deal gone wrong and therefore, if we are being monitored, we will all be looked for. I want you to be ready to come in. That body may not have weapons, but a ton of metal moving at speed is not to be ignored, Linda states. Not to mention I can just bring in this, Laszlo says, reaching into the divider between the front seats and removing the bottom. He quickly removes the parts of a rifle and assembles it. How many weapons are in this car? Not counting mine? Chank asks in amusement. Of course, Linda says with a sigh. A lot. It's a very safe bet that no matter how officially unarmed and undaunted is, there's enough ordnance within arm's reach to do just about anything you could want with it, Laszlo says comfortably. In fact, the closest I've been to unarmed was before I was in the van and in the station. Brr. It was like being naked or something. Humans, Linda remarks with a shake of her head as she opens the door. To be fair to my species, I'm pretty sure the weapon fetish is highly exaggerated in the undaunted like myself. So you admit it's a fetish? Linda asks him. I won't pretend that the shock pistol ups the attraction factor, Chink says, and Linda can't help a slight blush. There we go. Relax. Nothing good will happen from being too tense and stiff to get anything done. You need to calm down. Pre-anything jitters are usually worse than... I know that. I'm not some amateur. This situation is a huge problem. 
If Argus is tied into the shroud, we're walking into a trap. If not, we need to get him into protective custody. And either way, if the shroud is even half as intelligent as they seem to be, there's going to be a bluff involved. Whether it's a distraction to get us off his trail or a frame-up has yet to be determined. Either way, we need to be focused. Get in, talk, spot anything weird and get out. Yes, Chink says. So why aren't we doing it already? Vera asks. Because we haven't entered the building yet? Chink asks. Oh my god, you idiots. Get moving, Laszlo chides them all. There's a touch more banter and grumbling, but just a few minutes later, all three of them are just outside Argus's door. Or rather, Linda is in front of the door and both Vera and Chank are to the sides. Honestly, it looks like the three of them are about to jump him. What? What are you? Argus begins with his timid routine and Vera rushes in, picks him up and sets him down out of the way for Linda and Chank. Linda closes the door and quickly turns on the privacy field. Are you people insane? Argus demands with wild eyes. Coming back here this soon? After a fight where local girls got hospitalized due to frenzy patches? Do you want the fucking building to burn down? What in the hell is wrong with you? We need to talk, Linda states plainly. No shit. What the hell is it this time? What makes you think that coming here after your faces became burned into the public consciousness as police officers? You shouldn't be here for months, if not years, to let memories fade a little. Argus, Chank says, putting his hand on the man's shoulder, then grinning. I can't help but notice that you have a control collar lying flat under your shirt. We need to have a talk. Linda draws her shock pistol and levels it at the man. Sit down. You need to answer some questions and we can have them answered here or in an interrogation cell. Whoa, now what's this? It's not illegal to, hey, stay out of there. Argus cuts off his defense as Vera starts poking around the apartment and starts opening doors at random. Nia, it's just a bathroom? Unless it's not, Vera asks before slinking in and banging on all the walls. Hello, what's... It happens all at once. Gravity suddenly shifts a full 90 degrees and increases to 50 times its normal power. Chank grabs onto the door frame even as the door itself is shattered and catches Linda to stop her from slamming into the concrete opposite. He lets her down gently so she can stand on the wall below and actually dodge even as the door frame creaks, groans, and then breaks all in a few moments. When he lands on the wall, he lands hard and it cracks. Hmm. I was hoping you'd have caught on to my earlier clues. I was planning on abandoning this place and life a long time ago. Argus? What? No, not Argus. Never again will I be a mewling, simpering, pathetic. The ranting carob is cut off by several tons of pissed of saber-toothed tiger which is then immediately tackled into from behind by the familiar hooded prosthetic body of the shroud. They both tumble down the hallway and Chank and Linda are forced to dodge even as the gravity increases again. The prosthetic shatters like spun glass and Argus throws back his head to laugh. Goodbye to the old and hello to the new. I am reborn. I am more than just the shroud. I am more than pathetic little Argus. I am a force of my own. I am a genius. I am not finished. Argus continues to rant before he notices Chank drawing a weapon. The gravity around him shifts into knots and the bullet outright loops the loop before slamming into the gun. The gravity increases again, and if not for the axiom reinforcing all three of them, their bodies would have long been crushed to past, even as the reinforced internal structure of the building groans and whines. Fine, I'll keep this brief, Argus says as he reaches up and removes a fur-covered patch from his forehead. The more he pulls at it, the more of an antler is revealed until it's shown that he has a hardy pair of carob antlers. Both of them glow with power as he chuckles. The arrival of the humans and their media gave me the final push I needed to remake myself. I abandon Argus, I leave behind the shroud. Call me Moriarty. 
then he and the insane shifted gravity is gone. 